Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful winter day. I am Gil Christenberry. I have the honor and the privilege of being your lay leader this morning for our Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Lower Bucks. As always, I urge you to put your Zoom controls on speaker view for your best viewing experience. So welcome. Welcome to this congregation where for over half a century now, we have been seeking to foster community, to grow our spirits, to serve others, and to work for justice. We're very glad that you've joined us here in our sacred cyberspace and hope that you will experience love, acceptance, and hopefully some inspiration. After our service, please feel welcome to join us for some very informal fellowship and conversation. We continue with our monthly touchstone themes, and for February, our theme is power. Gandhi is a reminder that we all possess power. The problem is that we often struggle with our power by denying it or misusing it, or at times even abusing it. As Marianne Williamson writes, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. <clears throat> it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Using power well is not easy. Our tools include reason, nonviolence, and courage to oppose hatred, violence, deceit, and more. Power is best used with humility and with the objective of creating a win-win result, which is best done when we seek to empower others. I'm very pleased to say that we have one of our very favorite guest speakers today. The Reverend Libby Smith is here with us. And she is delighted to come back here where she had the honor of serving as minister from 2007 to 2013, although the honor was all ours, really. She was ordained in 1992, and she also served congregations in Rockport, Massachusetts, and in Warrington, and spent five years as chaplain at the UU House Retirement Home in Philadelphia. Now retired from congregational service, she enjoys the chance to do pulpit supply and rites of passage on request. The title of her sermon today is Joining Forces. So often we may feel called to make a difference in the world, to work for change, to speak truth to power, but feel too small. How can one person make a difference? But when we join our own power with that of others, whether a higher power or the collective power of a community, all kinds of things become possible. Now, let us enter into work together. For our musical prelude this morning, as always, I'm very proud to introduce our amazing musician, Mr. Avi Wisnia. Good morning. We start with the song that I learned when I was at summer camp. It's a song by Lore Wyatt called Dreamer, Song of Peace. And it's a song about what we can build and achieve when we work together. are young and a dreamer keeps a dreaming ages along keeps a dreaming keeps a dreaming along ba -da -da -da. keeps a dreaming keeps a dreaming along ba -da -da -da. keeps a dreaming keeps a dreaming along what do we do when we needed corn we plowed and we sowed till the early morn for our hands are strong and our hearts are young and a dreamer keeps a dreaming Ba 
da 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 Keep to dreaming, keep to dreaming along. What do we do when we needed a town? Well, we hammered and we nailed till the sun went down. What do we do when we needed a town? We hammered and we nailed till the sun went down. For our hands are strong and our hearts are young. And a dreamer keeps a dreaming. Ages long, keep to dreaming, keep to dreaming along. Ba da da da. we want well it's more than anyone can build or plant we gather our friends from the ends of the earth to lend a hand in this hour of birth we'll plow we'll sow we'll hammer and we'll nail we'll work all day till peace is real Thank you, Avi. That was a real toe tapper. <laughs> Please feel free to join me as I read our chalice lighting words. Mindful that with great power comes great responsibility, we light this chalice in the hopes that in brightest day and blackest night, our faith will flame on. Our opening words this morning are from the author Susan Paulus Schutz. This life is yours. Take the power to choose what you want to do and do it well. Take the power to love what you want in life and love it honestly. Take the power to walk in the forest and be a part of nature. Take the power to control your own life. No one else can do it for you. We have a nice message for all ages now. I think you'll enjoy. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Beck Stow, and our message for all ages today is The All Together Quilt by Lizzie Rockwell. This true story is based on the work of Piece by Piece, the Norwalk Community Quilt Project, of which the author is a longtime member. Jennifer and her friends meet on Fridays at the community center. They are making a quilt. Everyone works together. First, Jennifer picks a fabric from the dark colors. Fran picks a fabric from the light colors. Jennifer traces a shape on the dark fabric. Then she traces a shape on the light fabric. Fran cuts out the two shapes. Jennifer pins them together. Fran sews them together. Richard and Maurice work together. They trace and cut and pin and sew. Look, two triangles together make one square. Two rectangles together make one square. Fran and Jennifer Richard and Maurice, Maria and Jocelyn, Natalyn and Viola, Sana and Melissa, Anna Mae and Trinity, Angela and Betty, Ernestine and Zach. Together in pairs, they make eight squares. Except for Nika. Nika works on one blue square. She uses special pens and paints and brushes. Next, they arrange the squares. They turn them and move them this way and that. There are so many combinations. The last one they try is their favorite. 
This quilt will have a border around four sides. Jocelyn measures and Anna Mae cuts four white rectangles. The pieces look plain, but not for long. Anna helps Jennifer cover the palm of her hand with paint. Jennifer presses her hand onto the fabric. Friends are invited to make handprints too. Now all the pieces are ready. Labels show which piece goes where. They pin and sew and iron all the pieces together. Soon the patchwork is complete. Now it is time to layer the quilt. The layers are held in place with basting stitches. The quilt is attached to wooden rods. It's rolled tight and stretched across sawhorses. At the frame, Sana learns to stitch. She pokes the needle down from the top and back up from below. It is hard to find the right spot. She practices and learns. It takes a long time to quilt the quilt. Everybody lends a hand. On many, many Fridays, they sit and stitch and talk together. Finally, the last stitch is stitched. The quilt is taken off the frame. It is trimmed into a neat square. Dot sews on a purple binding to close the edges. Many hands worked together to make this beautiful quilt. But who will have it now that it is done? Everyone will have it. It hangs in the library for all to see. It's the quilt that Jennifer and her friends made all together. The end. Thank you for that beautiful story, Bex. <clears throat> it's amazing what when people come together, they can accomplish when they have a goal. And I was reminded by that story of the many beautiful works of art that our very own Nancy Lesh has given us over the years through her sweat and tears and talent. So thank you for that, Nancy. For our musical interlude this morning, Avi has chosen and will perform a song by Kenny Loggins. Every song the world sings, each was once unknown. Somebody felt a song inside and wasn't afraid to sing alone. If you feel the music and you sing it clear and true, then the world can sing with you. One small voice can teach the world a song. Start with one small voice till another sings along. Sings along, and then you 
Thank you, Avi. That was really beautiful. <clears throat> it's good to remember that we all have a voice. Now it's my extreme pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest speaker, the Reverend Libby Smith, for her reading. Thank you, Gil. You know, so often, Avi has such a gift for choosing music that fits the theme that I listened to his first two pieces and I feel as though the sermon's really already been given <clears throat> because everything that you really needed to hear this morning, you've already heard from Avi. But since I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead. The reading comes this morning from the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. She writes, let us covenant with one another to keep faith with the source of life, knowing that we are not our own, earth made us. Let us covenant with one another to keep faith with the community of resistance, never to forget that life can be saved from that which threatens it by even small bands of people choosing to put into practice an alternative way of life. And let us covenant with one another to seek for an ever deeper awareness of that which springs up inwardly in us. Even when our hearts are broken by our own failure or the failure of others cutting into our lives. Even when we have done all we can and life is still broken, there is a universal love that has never broken faith with us and never will. This is the ground of our hope and the reason we can be bold in seeking to fulfill the promise. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> for our offertory, last month, Advocates for Homeless and Those in Need was the recipient of our split plate with their Code Blue program, which serves adults who are homeless in Lower Bucks County. But there exists another program to help younger adults and children, and that is the Valley Youth House and their Synergy Project. These aim to help those under the age of 21. The Synergy Project is focused on connecting with this population on the streets, providing food and other essentials. Young people in need are introduced to and encouraged to use these available services. February is a bitter cold month, so please visit our website or e-newsletter and make a donation to this cause. Thank you for your generosity. <clears throat> Reverend Libby will now share her sermon, Joining Forces. Well, it wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't really my intention to get into a sermon series with you folks. But that seems to be the way it's sort of working out. Although with the sermons spread out rather widely since the first one in the series was last fall. But last September, I preached on the new normal, arguing that it isn't good enough to rebuild things the way they used to be, that we need to create something new and different, something better. And then last month, I acknowledged that as energizing and exciting as that idea might be, it's easy to feel a bit overwhelmed at the thought of taking on that much transformation. And I suggested that sometimes we need to slow down to look within and see what needs to be nurtured in our own soul. That until we tend to our personal transformation, it's hard to summon up the energy to transform the world. So the recap for those two goes kind of like this. Hey folks, forget about going back to the way things used to be. That wasn't good enough and it's time to blow up everything that came before and create a better world. And then, but wait, first, maybe we need to remember that we need to take a breath, take a look inward, rather than wear ourselves out trying to become something we're not, let our lives flow from the best version of who we are, because that will allow our work to be sustainable and effective. And then we come to this month with its theme of power. I didn't like the theme. I don't like to think about power. I don't like to talk about power. I think power makes a lot of us uncomfortable, even as we understand how important it is. 
but it fit right into the next step of the process that I was on, because we can recognize the need for change. And we can look deeply into ourselves and find the strengths and the gifts from which we can best work for that change. And we can still feel small and overwhelmed and doubtful of our ability to make a difference. It's easy to feel powerless in the face of so much that needs to be changed, whether we're talking about our own personal lives or the wider world. So this month, I want to talk about joining forces, joining power to power. Because of course, we feel small when we look at the things we want to change, whether we're talking about our personal lives, our local communities, or the wider world. We are small. Let's just face that. I'm, I'm small. I'm one small person in an enormous world. And there's no question that when I act alone, my power is severely limited often inadequate. But who says we should be acting alone? I chose the reading from Rebecca Parker for this morning because she takes us on a journey in that meditation through different ways of joining forces to find the strength together that we can't find alone. She begins by reminding us to keep faith with the source of life, that we are not our own, but made of the earth, grounded if you will, she invites us to ground ourselves, to connect with the earth. And then she reminds us to keep faith with one another in community, working together, to remember that, quote, life can be saved from that which threatens it by even small bands of people choosing to put into practice an alternative way of life. So there's the power of human beings connecting with other human beings and working together. And then she circles back to that source of life, that grounding, as she asks us to seek a deeper awareness of that which springs up inwardly in us. And she assures us that there is a universal love that has never broken faith with us and never will. She's essentially inviting us to join our power with a higher power. Now, I admit that language sometimes makes me uncomfortable. I don't know what to do with that term, higher power, although I have an awful lot of friends who find it helpful. And I don't always feel the presence of that universal love Dr. Parker talks about, even though I'd like to. But there's something about her flow from our connection to the earth, to our connection with one another, to our connection with that ever faithful universal love that still provided a framework for me this morning. And I wanna begin, odd as it may sound to some of you, with a piece I just received in my inbox from the Unitarian Universalist Christian Fellowship about the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, I realize that's probably not where you were expecting me to go this morning, and I assure you I'm not going to stay there very long. But this piece was written by the UUCF's executive director, Jake Morrill. And some of you know that I lean toward the Christian end of the UU spectrum. I reject most of the theological claims about Jesus, but I find that the stories about him often speak directly to my heart. And I get excited when I hear someone interpret one of those stories in a new way, in a way that makes sense for me and opens up new possibilities for meaning. So Jake was writing about the transfiguration because whether or not you were aware of this today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's the Sunday in the Christian church when the transfiguration is lifted up. Now the transfiguration is an event in the gospels where Jesus has gone up to the mountain with his friends, Peter, John, and James, in order to pray. And while they're up there, we're told, something happens. Jesus becomes radiant. He is bathed in light. His face shines like the sun. His companions have a vision of him talking with Moses and with Elijah. And they hear the voice of God say, he is my chosen one, listen to him. Now, in his piece, Jake points out that the transfiguration is often held up as one more event in the Gospels that just points out how utterly different Jesus is from us. 
his holiness and his radiance in stark contrast to our dim and fallen nature. Jake, being a Unitarian Universalist Christian, doesn't see it quite that way. And he suggests there's another way to hear the story. And here I'm quoting directly from Jake Morell. When his earthly body shines with the luminescence of the divine, we are reminded that God doesn't speak through fantastical creatures or ethereal phenomena, but through ordinary people and familiar things. We are surrounded at each moment with potential vessels and vehicles for the holy, capable of receiving and reflecting that of God. I'm going to read that last line again. We are surrounded at each moment with potential vessels and vehicles of the holy, capable of receiving and reflecting that of God. Now, as a UU who also has a great love for Jesus, I find this interpretation really helpful because I like to think of Jesus as an ordinary person, not as the one and only being who shone forth with the light of the divine, who received and reflected that of God, but one who lived his whole life trying to show us that we all have that potential and to model a way of living that made it more likely that we might experience that sense of wholeness and holiness. It's not, at least not in my understanding, that Jesus was God. It's that he understood better than most how to live in harmony with God, to be a conduit for goodness to manifest that universal love, however you choose to understand that concept. Now, I know there are lots of people who believe that they experience God in a very direct and personal way. I've always kind of envied that, but I am not one of those people. But Jesus has become for me a particularly vivid example of the way that the power of love appears in those ordinary people and familiar things that surround me every day, those potential vessels and vehicles for the holy. And when I can feel that connection and allow myself to believe that the spirit works through the ordinary people and familiar things around me, then it's easier for me to feel brave and strong. It's easier to keep going with whatever I need to do. I may sometimes doubt that universal love that keeps faith with us. But even in the midst of my doubt, I sometimes find myself encountering it through unexpected acts of kindness or courage in the people around me. Now, I realize that a lot of that language may not be helpful to you. And that's okay, because the underlying message in that illustration is simply the call to find ways to connect our own smallness with something that's larger and better than we are. We don't have to embrace stories about Jesus or use language of God or spirit in order to feel connected to something larger and better than ourselves. We don't have to accept the idea of a higher power to acknowledge the larger context within which we fit. Non-theistic traditions like Buddhism remind us that we are part of a whole that is so much larger than ourselves, that we are part of the essential goodness of being itself. Earth-centered traditions that may or may not contain a concept of God or goddess still emphasize our place in a beautiful, larger web of interconnectedness. Humanism lifts up the extraordinary power we can create when we join our hearts and minds and voices with other people's hearts and minds and voices and create something larger and better than we can be alone. The point is to find a way to connect, to connect with something bigger than we are, to join forces so that our small power grows larger and we grow stronger and braver. I believe that human beings are at heart communal creatures. You must all have at least some sense of that being the case because you could be sitting by yourself reading the Sunday paper 
or reading a book about spirituality or power or whatever improving theme you wanted to explore this morning, but you're not doing that in solitude. You've chosen to join this Zoom call with a community of other people who are exploring the same ideas. We all need a different balance between solitude and community. Some people need a lot more time alone. Some people need a lot more time with other people. But I think just about all of us need to feel some sense of connection to the human family. And that's not just an emotional need, it's also a practical one. We live in a world that has grown more and more to emphasize the value of self-sufficiency and doing everything on our own. But there are so many things where we just need other people. I mean, the classic example of the Amish barn raising comes to mind where everybody shows up and works together to do what needs to be done. But think about the times you've dropped off a casserole to a sick friend or someone has dropped something off for you. The times you've needed something. When I needed the enormous desk moved out of my office, there was no way I could do that by myself. But my son-in-law and my grandson were here to move it down the stairs for my husband. We're making the quilt in our story this morning. We need each other. I love that story about the altogether quilt that Bex chose for us. She always comes up with something perfect. I love the idea that a lot of little scraps that are quite insignificant on their own come together into a pattern that creates something beautiful. Because I like to think that the little scrap of my own life comes together in a larger pattern when I add it to each of the scraps that everybody else is contributing to a more beautiful pattern. I love the way that each person brings a different set of gifts and abilities, that they're young and old, that they're from different races and cultures, different skill levels, different perspectives. I love that they all work together to finish the project, teaching and learning as they work. And I love the way you can see in the pictures that they're building relationships as they work together. They're creating not just a quilt, but a community. When you think about the important things they could done in the world, they're very, they very rarely come down to one person acting alone. Sometimes they look like that. I think about Rosa Parks refusing to move to the back of the bus. And people think of that as this, this one person who had the courage to stand up and make a difference. But that seemingly solitary action grew out of a community of activists who had been working and planning together for a long time with intense organization around beginning the bus boycott. One maybe small example that I'm working with right now is going on within the larger Mennonite community where I make the other half of my religious home. Our little congregation up in Percy, Pennsylvania, voted years ago that we wanted to be welcome, welcoming and inclusive to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer folks. And within Mennonite circles, that's actually still a pretty radical thing to do. But we realized that even though we made this clear statement of welcome, something very important was missing because Mennonite pastors are still not permitted to conduct wedding ceremonies for same-sex couples or to affirm LGBTQ folks for staff or ministry roles. And how much of a full valued member of a church are you going to feel if your pastor won't conduct your wedding? There's a real problem there. And the congregation decided it was time to tackle that problem and go a step further. So we are now in a discernment process as a congregation, asking, instigated by our pastors, but led by a team that includes our pastors and a collection of lay people, asking the congregation to consider widening our statement of welcome to say explicitly that LGBTQ folks have all the benefits of membership, including marriage, and the right to be considered for leadership, staff, and ministry positions. This means our congregation could be sanctioned by the conference. It means our pastors could have their credentials revoked by the conference. But they're ready to take that risk, and most of us feel that it's long past the time to take this stand. So that all sounds brave and important, and yet we are this tiny, tiny little congregation 
I mean, I think the congregation is probably about the size of UUFLB. So we're not talking megachurch right here, right? We're talking a small group of close-knit, deeply committed folks. It's hard to feel as though this action, important as it feels to us, can have much of a difference in the wider Mennonite world. And yet, when we wanted to get more information about other congregations who had taken this step, look at other welcome statements to see what ours might look like, find out what had happened to them when they made these declarations, we were able to find those congregations because a group of supportive pastors had joined together, had written a church to the a letter to the larger church stating their position on this issue, amplified their voices by speaking together and publishing what they had to say. So they wrote and published this letter to the wider church which we were able to find, which supplied us with a list of who these pastors were and their congregations so we could go to their websites and look at their welcome statements and join our voice with their voices in a supportive network of pastors and congregations. And so suddenly we're not just one small voice crying in the wilderness. We're one voice in a chorus of voices. And although in the big picture, that chorus is still a small chorus, it may give other voices the courage to join us as well. To use our power well, to use it fully, we have to harness ourselves with others. We need to build relationships and deepen our understanding and work together. But there's one more thing I need to say about this, because joining forces with others as necessary as it is, can also lead to a dangerous narrowing of our focus and our perspective. If we only seek out people who think exactly the same way we do in our effort to join forces. It's really easy to look for the people who already agree with us, who will reinforce our own opinions. And in the process of figuring out how and when to collaborate, we also need to listen to people who challenge us to think beyond our own assumptions. Some of the people in this supportive pastors network in the Mennonite church didn't start out there. If they'd only listened to the people they already agreed with, they would still be preaching from their pulpits that homosexuality was a sin. But they found themselves listening to other people's voices and other people's stories that challenged their perceptions and they began to change their thinking. We also need to look for people who challenge us to look beyond our own assumptions. People whose life experiences have taught them things that we may not yet understand. People who may make us uncomfortable, but who are saying things that we need to hear. It's very tempting to stick with the folks who agree with us and keep us comfy. And liberals are quick to condemn conservatives for their tendency to do that. But people all across the political spectrum do the same thing. We create our own little bubbles of self-righteousness, and then we sit comfortably within them, so sure that we're better than the folks sitting in a different little bubble of self-righteousness. We like to assume that the lens through which we view the world is the normative lens, the correct lens. And that can really easily lead to the abuse of our power. The only way we can be effective allies for change is if we commit ourselves to listening to and learning from others and being really careful in discerning where we join our forces. Because joining forces when it's done well doesn't just amplify our power, it also helps to assure us that we use that power wisely and responsibly. And in a way that just brings us back full circle. Because we have to look to our grounding, we look to one another, we look to that universal love that shines through ordinary people and familiar things even sometimes through the people and things we prefer to overlook. As we continue our journey into this new year, I invite you to consider where you make the connections that help you to grow stronger and braver. The connections that challenge you and help you use your power wisely and responsibly. 
Well, I bet you find some of those connections here at the fellowship and probably with some of the community organizations that you support and partner with. Maybe in your workplace, your school, your family. Our task, all of us, is to seek out those connections, strengthen them and deepen them, build the relationships as we work together so that whenever we speak out, together our small voices can become a mighty chorus. Thank you, Reverend Libby. You have such a gift of sharing in such a way that we can relate to it and understand it. And thank you for sharing about what's going on in your congregation. Uh, you're going to have to let us know how that turns out. <laughs> That's really amazing. <clears throat> now is the time in our service when we recognize and lift up one another in love. Let us be fully present and listen with open hearts. If you wish to share a joy or a sorrow, please click on reactions and then click raise hand and that will help us find you and help you to unmute. For everyone's benefit, please be brief. Robin. Robin. Am I? Oh, yeah, you are. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to give you an update on dad and mom for that matter. Uh, dad is now in rehab. He, um, he was in the hospital for a week. Mm -hmm. He was transferred home for a week where he required 24 hour care until the PT came out and said he really needs to be in rehab. Uh, it's it's been a struggle, but um, as of yesterday, he's doing much better. He's smiling. Um, he's starting to eat some of the pureed foods that they're giving him. He can't have anything else at this point. Um, and he's doing well. You know, beginning he's just starting, but he's doing well with PT, OT, and speech. He's having speech or swallowing issues. So, uh, and mom on Wednesday had a pacemaker put in. So, you know, we've been pretty busy. Um, but, you know, they're doing well and they wanted me to send their love and, and thank you for all the cards and, and messages. It's been really nice. It's, it's, they've really appreciated the support. So, well, th everything's thank going you. well. Thank you for sharing that, Robin. Uh, it's oh. great news. Jeff Ellis. Jeff. Hello. Um, I learned this morning that a friend of mine, a fellow actor, passed away. He had gotten a stroke yesterday and didn't survive. I guess he was around 70, and he had been in like 50 movies and TV productions. So he was a mentor to me. He was great. I, we, we were in a film together. It's coming out. His name was Tony Devon. So I'm sad about that. Well, my prayers are with him and his family for sure. <clears throat> I certainly have a joy today uh, seeing Elizabeth Burdett out there. Welcome. <laughs> Long time no see. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, hello, I'm in Virginia for the week. So I figured since I'm on your time zone and I don't have to get up at early on Sundays, I figured I would join. Um, and I did get a job in Arizona for Sprouts Corporate as a data engineer. So that's a joy. There you go. Uh, that's great. That's good news. It's good to see you. Hmm? All right. Well, if no one else will share now we have time in our coffee hour to, to share as well so whether or not you shared today for your joys we in this community join you in celebration and for any sorrows or concerns may you feel our sympathy and our compassion let's take just a moment for gratitude silent meditation and prayer
for our closing song, Tom has chosen one of our favorite hymns. Please join me in our closing hymn number 121, We'll Build a Land. We'll do three verses together. Thank you, Avi. <clears throat> Please feel free to join me as I read our closing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our service is now concluded Please feel free to stay for our very informal coffee hour. <laughs> uh, you can now unmute yourself and use the chat function. <clears throat>